Hello, and welcome back to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Allison Lawrence. I'm a pediatric dietitian in Southern California, and I'm also a certified nutrition support clinician, and I am your host for this foundational series. In today's video, we are going to be discussing everything about infant feedings from a human milk standpoint, fortification, as well as different formulas. First, we're going to begin with human milk. So human milk is the preferred nutrition source for all infants as it's uniquely designed in order to be able to meet the nutritional and immunological benefits. Human milk provision is associated with a decreased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis or NEC, retinopathy of prematurity or ROP, as well as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It is also associated with a decreased risk of late onset sepsis and is really important for overall neurocognitive development. So the brain is rapidly growing within the first two to three years of life. So really being able to provide optimal nutrition during this time is critical. Human milk offers not only micro and macronutrient needs, but also offers different immunological benefits. It is quite variable. It varies dependent on the environmental factors, maternal factors, as well as storage and handling factors. The different lactation stages also contribute to the variability within human milk, and they can generally be divided into three different categories. We first have colostrum, and colostrum is going to be the first part of the human milk that is going to be produced, usually within the first couple of days of lactation. Colostrum is higher within protein. It's about a 90 to 10 ratio of whey to casein, and although it does have higher protein content within it, colostrum serves more of an immunological benefit. So it offers white blood cells, antibodies, as well as different immunological factors like lactoferrin, epidermal growth factor, leukocytes, and IgA. We then have transitional milk, which is that in-between stage between colostrum and mature human milk, and usually is that period of transition for a couple of days into lactation. We then have mature human milk, and this is going to be higher within fat content, lower within protein, and is going to be the last stage of lactation where the human milk will be a little bit more consistent and not as variable. Human milk is composed majority of water. It's about 87 to 88% water. The caloric concentration varies, so different studies have analyzed human milk and have found it to be potentially 13 to 14 calorie per ounce, depending on the person, or as high as 26, 27, and 28 calorie per ounce. But on average, we take the mean of those numbers and we say that it's 20 calories per ounce. But we truly don't know that unless we were to analyze it. The main carbohydrate source of human milk is going to be lactose, and that does contribute to the osmotic load. Our protein source is going to be a mixture of whey and casein, and preterm human milk is going to be higher within protein content than mature human milk. But this does dramatically decrease over a period of time. So around day 28 of lactation, that protein content of the preterm human milk will now be much lower. The main fat source is going to be long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, and then has different immunological factors like IgA, lactoferrin, alpha-lactobumin, cytokines, as well as human milk oligosaccharides. If there's instances where the own parents are not able to provide human milk for the infant, we can also be able to utilize donor milk. So donor milk can be purchased by different institutions from different donor milk banks in order to be able to provide human milk still to the infant. Donor milk is going to be analyzed, it's going to be pasteurized, and also screened for different disease factors and is preferred to be utilized in patient populations that are considered to be high risk. Donor milk is utilized in the preterm infant patient population because there is a dose-dependent relationship between human milk provision and decreased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. It can also be utilized for surgical infants where we're concerned for being able to have adequate GI perfusion, as well as in infants with CHD where we're also concerned for being able to have limited GI perfusion due to the cardiac condition. Some institutions might have a more liberal donor milk policy, so it also might be utilized in order to be able to bridge that gap between mom's milk being able to come in uh, to the amounts that the baby is actually taking. Human milk, although it's the preferred nutrition source, sometimes still does require additional fortification to meet the unique needs of the infant. Fortifiers can generally be divided into three different categories. We first have human milk-derived human milk fortifiers, and these are derived from human milk and they're often utilized when we're trying to provide an exclusive human milk diet for an infant. We then have our cow's milk derived human milk fortifiers and these contain protein sources that either are intact or extensively hydrolyzed. And the manufacturer's recommendations of usage for these are going to be for infants that are less than 3.6 kilograms. 
We then have our formula for powdered fortification, and these can be divided into two different subclassifications. We first have the preterm infant category. So this is where we would be able to fortify that human milk with a discharge formula in order to provide higher calcium, phosphorus, and protein in that human milk. We then have our term infant powdered formula fortification, and this would be designed for a term infant that has a higher caloric demand. So in this situation, it would be appropriate to fortify that human milk with a term infant formula. And it's important to remember that any time that you're instructing your families to be able to add powdered formula powder to human milk, that you're also educating them on how to safely handle it and prepare it because powder is not considered to be sterile. We can then move into our infant formula category. So an infant formula is designed to serve the sole purpose of being able to simulate human milk. It is considered to be exempt when it's altered for a specific medical need or condition because it no longer serves that purpose of just being able to simulate human milk. It is regulated by the FDA and there are different levels established for nutrients. So we have 29 recommended levels and nine maximum levels for nutrients of concern. And this has been changed a little bit as we are coming out of an infant formula shortage where our FDA did expand and loosen some of these restrictions to be able to allow for formulas to be imported into the United States. So they had ranges for specific nutrients that they would allow so that we could be able to continue to provide formula for infants in the United States. Infant formulas can generally be divided into three different forms. So we first have powdered formulations, and this would be where you're mixing scoops of powdered formula to ounces of water. We have liquid concentrate, which in a standard caloric preparation are usually mixed in a ratio of one to one of liquid concentrate to water. And then we have ready to feed formulations, which are considered to be sterile. Infant formulas can be divided into many, many different classifications and categories. And we'll talk about each of those as well as their indicated usage. First, we have standard infant formulas, and these are typically 20 calories per ounce. They're usually cow's milk protein derived. However, there have been new and emerging formulas such as goat's milk formulas. They're iron fortified and they have varying weight to casein ratios. Standard infant formulas also include a subgroup classification of organic. So organic formulas just mean how the ingredients were prepared, how they were processed, utilizing natural substances and farming methods that really meet that USDA definition of being a organic classification. We then have reduced lactose formulas. So if you think back to when we were talking about human milk, the primary carbohydrate in human milk is lactose. So babies are not lactose intolerant. They do have the ability to be able to digest lactose with lactase, um, but oftentimes you might see reduced lactose formulations utilized in when we're manipulating other ingredients within the formula. So say for example, we're hydrolyzing a protein that is going to increase the osmolality. So therefore, sometimes the lactose content will also be reduced to keep that osmolality underneath the AAP recommendations of less than 450 milliosmoles. These are not to be utilized for infants with galactosemia. We then have partially hydrolyzed formulas. So partially hydrolyzed formulas vary dependent on the degree of hydrolysis and the type of protein that's hydrolyzed. And these have been shown to be effective in research for treatment of atopic dermatitis, as well as might potentially be helpful to aid in different types of gas or in stomach discomfort. We then have soy formulas. So soy formulas are indicated for use in galactosemia and also might be utilized for parents that are vegan or vegetarian due to food beliefs and practices. So these formulas have added amounts of methionine in them to order to make them a complete protein as methionine is that limiting amino acid. So we want to ensure full protein delivery. And soy formulas are not appropriate to utilize for a preterm infant. We then have added rice starch formulas. So these formulas are designed to be able to thicken once they hit the stomach acid in order to be able to decrease incidence of reflux. So if you have a neonatal patient that is on a proton pump inhibitor that's suppressing acid, these formulas will not be effective in their use because they really rely on that stomach acid in order to be able to thicken. Added rice starch formulas should also not be calorically concentrated higher than 24 calories per ounce as the formula can become too thick. We then have extensively hydrolyzed formulas. So these are considered to be hypoallergenic and they are used as a first line treatment for cow's milk protein allergy. Some of these formulations also have higher amounts of MCT within them, so they're appropriate to utilize for patients with GI or hepatobiliary disorders. 
As MCT bypasses the lymphatic system, it's absorbed directly into portal blood and doesn't require any bile acids or salts for, for digestion. So it also can be utilized for something like biliary atresia. We then have free amino acid based formulas. So these are considered to be non-allergenic and they're utilized as treatment of choice for eosinophilic esophagitis. They can also be used as a second line for cow's milk protein allergy that was non-responsive to that extensively hydrolyzed formula or can also be utilized in short bowel syndrome when we're transitioning a neonate off of parenteral nutrition to enteral if human milk is not available. We then have different formulas that are available for specific metabolic conditions. So first we have fat modified formulas, and this might be utilized for a patient that has a metabolic disorder that affects fat metabolism, or can also be utilized in a child that needs lower fat provision, such as in chylothorax. We also have carbohydrate modified formulas, and these might be utilized for patients that have a metabolic disorder that inhibits normal carbohydrate metabolism. There are also reduced mineral formulas, so these are often lower within potassium, phosphorus, as well as calcium, and are designed for patients that have renal dysfunction in order to provide lower mineral delivery. We then have our preterm infant formula categories, and these can generally be divided into two different classifications. First, we have our preterm formulas, and these are often coming in a ready-to-feed, and they can be mixed together in order to be able to achieve a desired caloric concentration. They're higher within protein, higher within calcium and phosphorus, and are uniquely designed in order to be able to meet the needs of a preterm infant. These are often utilized for infants that were born with a gestational age of less than 34 weeks or had a birth weight that was less than 1,500 grams. We then have our discharge formulas, and at a standard caloric preparation, they are 22 calories per ounce, and these serve as an in-between between that standard infant formula and the preterm formula. So it's really designed for the neonate that's discharging home from the NICU that still requires higher nutrient requirements and is not quite ready yet for a standard infant formula. Probably one of the most common questions that I get from my families is how long will these infants be on this formula? And it's really a combination of a couple of different factors. So number one, you want to take into consideration what their gestational age was at birth, what their current gestational age is now, what their birth weight is, as well as what their overall weight gain and trends have been. Now, there might be some instances where you require a higher caloric concentration for your infant in order to meet their caloric demands. And we can do this with either powdered formulations or with liquid concentrate. If you are going to be increasing the caloric concentration of a powdered infant formula, there's a couple of pieces of information that you need. Number one, you need to know how many grams of powder are per scoop. You need to know the calories per gram of powder. And then you also need to know the displacement per gram of powder, which is given in mLs. And these can be obtained directly from your manufacturer's website, from your product guides, or you can also be able to obtain them from your representative. So we are going to practice this and analyze a recipe a patient was given in order to determine the caloric concentration that they're mixing to. So patient A's mother tells you she was told to mix her discharge formula to a higher calorie concentration to help with weight gain. The recipe she was given is four scoops of formula to six ounces of water, and we are going to determine what caloric concentration she is mixing to. So per our manufacturer, our grams of powder per scoop is 9.8 grams. Our calories per gram of powder is five calories, and our displacement per gram of powder is 0.78 mLs. First, I'm going to determine how many grams of powder the recipe has. So I will take four scoops times by 9.8 grams and get a total of 39.2 grams. I will then determine total calories. So I will take 39.2 times by five calories per gram and get a total of 196 calories. We will then determine the amount of water that is displaced, so I will take 39.2 grams times by 0.78 mLs and get a total of 30.58 mLs, which I will then convert over to ounces, so that ends up being 1.02 ounces. We will now determine our final caloric concentration, so first we'll add the 6 ounces of water from the recipe with the 1.02 ounces of water that was displaced to get a total of 7.02 ounces. We will now divide our total calories, so 196 calories divided by 7.02 ounces, and get a final caloric concentration of 28 calories per ounce. That concludes today's video. Please feel free to stay tuned to the Dietitians and Nutrition Support YouTube channel, where we discuss all things pediatrics in our foundational series. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below.